Hi there. Halloween is upon us once again, and the season is here for monsters and spirits and witchcraft and magic. Indeed, now is the time of year when many of us break out our cauldrons for some holiday magic, and whether your magic has to do with casting spells or with conjuring up a delicious harvest feast to celebrate this night, Probably the most famous image of Halloween is that of a witch brewing a magical potion in her cauldron. There's something traditional and mystical about cooking in an old cauldron, and there have been many kinds of cauldrons made over the years and the centuries. And for those of us who may want to own and use our own cauldrons, here's a look at some of the kind of cauldrons you may find in your search for vintage cast iron. Now, the word cauldron is an old word that simply means a big cooking pot, and over the centuries, people have made cauldrons in every size and shape imaginable. About the only thing these cauldrons have in common is they're round, and they range from incredibly elaborate display pieces used at royal feasts to the simple but durable cooking pots used by families across the globe, and often passed down from one generation to the next. There's a lot of history that stems from cooking in a cauldron, and that is one of the greatest attractions to using one, especially during this time of year. I took a trip to Salem, Massachusetts in search of cauldrons, and the ones I saw there all came from the same company. They were brand new and imported from a company based in India. Looking at these cauldrons on their website show they're meant for ceremonial purposes, such as burning offerings and rituals. What it does not say, however, is whether these tiny cauldrons are safe for preparing food. Of course, a tiny cauldron like this wouldn't exactly be a centerpiece for preparing a good meal in the kitchen. For that, we need to look at other kinds of cauldrons, both vintage and new. This cast iron pot is a poiki, and it's very popular for use as a cauldron because it's shaped like a classic medieval style cauldron. Poikis come from South Africa, where even today manufacturers make them in this style. They're quite popular in that country, and they can easily be purchased brand new, though the cost can be prohibitive if you want to import one of these into the U.S. Sadly, the last African manufacturer of these pots, Falkirk, went out of business around 2010. Since then, all of these cast iron poikis have been made in Asia and imported into South Africa for sale. If you want a big cast iron cauldron that you can use for literally anything, including cooking in the kitchen as well as other uses for a cauldron, the easiest way to go is to look for a cast iron Dutch oven. In fact, this is indeed a modern day cauldron because it's descended from the original cast iron cauldrons that were part of every kitchen. The design of a modern Dutch oven is different from an old-school cauldron, but it's still a very pleasing design, and it will certainly perform as well as any cast-iron cauldron. What's more, there are many different designs of Dutch ovens, and they've been made in all shapes and sizes for the past 300 years. And even if you have even the least interest in cooking, I highly recommend using a cast-iron Dutch oven in your kitchen. These pots are immensely useful, and you can cook just about anything in one of these. There is a Dutch oven out there to fit your budget, whether you can afford a simple modern pot or a vintage cast iron piece from Griswold or Wagner. Enamel Dutch ovens are very easy to find at any big box store, and if you go to a sporting goods store, you can easily get a bare cast iron Dutch oven or a camp oven with legs for going over a fire. Or you could go on a treasure hunt for vintage cast iron and look at antique malls, flea markets, estate sales, or even junkyards and see if you can find yourself a cast iron Dutch oven that way. And of course, you can find anything online these days, including cauldrons. An amazing variety of cauldrons can be seen online, both new and old. Of course, buying a cauldron online may be more than your budget will allow. 
This is one of my favorite cauldrons, a huge four-gallon Dutch oven from Bayou Classic. It's one of many big iron pots made in Asia and sold here in the USA. I got this from Amazon in 2012 when I needed a really big cast iron pot to take on a summer camping trip to a spiritual outing with the OTO. That was a fun time, and getting to cook with this big cauldron was definitely one of the highlights of that trip. And I have to admit, this isn't even my largest cast iron pot. And if you're seriously interested in a really, really big cast iron cauldron, you may want to look to the southern United States and see about getting a big jambalaya pot. Several companies import huge cast iron pots from Asia, especially to be used in making massive amounts of Cajun dishes, such as jambalaya, Brunswick stew, and seafood boils. These big pots certainly do have a hefty price tag, though maybe less so if you find a way to avoid the shipping cost. And of course, the advantage is they're brand new and they barely need to be cleaned up before using. And all over the world, they're making all sorts of cauldrons, all of which are useful and very attractive and magical. But of course, the final decision of which one to get lies with you. And it's really just a question of which cauldron is the right one for you, as well as which one you can afford. Fortunately, no matter what your budget is, there's certain to be a cauldron out there for you. In your search for a cast iron cauldron, you should be aware of two or three kinds of iron pots that you may want to reconsider especially if you're looking for something to cook food in, as well as potions. This is a cast iron fire starter. It usually comes with a lid plus a soapstone wand. What you do is you fill it with kerosene and place the wand into the liquid. Soapstone is very porous and it'll absorb the kerosene. Then you light it and you have a perfect fire starter for campfires and other fires. I bought this for $15. You can get it brand new at sporting goods stores and websites for $40 to $50. And some antique malls will sell these as cauldrons for $60, $75, or $80 or even more. Now, if you just want to burn something in there, it's an excellent cauldron since that's what it's made for. But because it's made for holding kerosene and other fuels, you may want to think twice about cooking food in this. Every so often at an antique mall, you may come across a big cast iron pot that's bare on the outside, but the inside is enameled. Of course, the enamel is almost always in extremely poor condition, and it's almost certainly cracked, crazed, and chipped. If you were to heat up a big pot like this, the enamel is almost certain to shatter, and you certainly don't want tiny, sharp splinters and dust in your concoctions. But just as important is the fact that enamelware manufacturers of the 19th century often used lead in the enamel glaze on the inside of their pots. Pieces like this are safe to touch, but in no way should you ever try cooking food in one of these pieces. So a pot like this should be for display purposes only. Another kind of cast iron pot to watch out for is a lead smelting pot. These pots are easy to spot since they're always extremely thick and heavy and they have huge thick lifting handles. What's more, they usually have an obvious lead residue on them. These pots are great for melting lead and metal, of course, and if you do metal work, then a pot like this can be a real score. Just make sure you don't prepare anything edible in a pot like this. Antique sellers want us to think any big, rusty pot is a vintage cauldron from the 1700s or 1800s because, of course, they want us to buy it. Older cauldrons have two markings that identify them as vintage, a gate mark on the bottom and a sprue mark around the entire pot that shows the mark where the two halves of the mold came together during the manufacturing process. 
Most newer modern cauldrons don't have these marks, though these big cauldrons in particular did have gate marks as late as the first half of the 20th century, when cooking stoves and modern washing machines meant it was no longer necessary for a household to have a really big pot. This small cauldron is a curiosity, and my roommate's son found it for me at a flea market for $10. It has a gate mark and a sprue mark, but the manufacturer took the time to grind down these markings. This probably means this pot was cheaply made, and it's actually modern, though it's designed in the style of a vintage cauldron. Meanwhile, I found this big cauldron in New Bedford, Massachusetts on my birthday for only $20. I think it was selling so cheap because it doesn't sit flat. The legs must have been broken or cut down at some point in the past. It doesn't have any markings to identify the manufacturer, but I think it may be a genuine vintage cauldron because of the flat top ears, as well as having a sprue mark uh, all around and a gate mark on the bottom. And so what if it doesn't sit flat? It works just fine hanging from a tripod. In the latter half of the 19th century, cast iron cooking stoves were introduced and they changed the way we cook in our kitchen. As an accessory to these stoves, manufacturers introduced these stovetop cooking kettles, which are also called bulge kettles because of the way they were shaped. These were meant as complementary throwaway items, and when you purchased a stove, you'd get a set of cookware to go with it. That included a skillet, a griddle, and probably one of these kettles. The cylindrical bottom of the kettle was meant to be placed in the eye of the stove, while the top was wider to allow more room for cooking stews, soups, and other foods. The center hole was intentionally set off-center, so you could put two or more of these on a stove and rotate them in order to make them all fit. These kettles may be made of cast iron, but they were still very thin, and today you can find them everywhere. However, quite a few of them are seen with the bottom completely rusted out or with holes punched in them in order to make them into planters. If you can find one of these whole and intact, it's certainly worth the effort to restore it and put it to good use. Meanwhile, this is a number 12 size Dutch oven from Birmingham Stoven Range. It was made in Alabama somewhere from the 1960s to the 1970s and I've used this pot to make Brunswick stew, gumbo, and huge pots of Boston baked beans. About the only way I would ever get rid of this pot is if I found an older model from the same manufacturer, which they called their Red Mountain series but that's just because I'm a cast iron geek. And then we get into those really big ancient cast iron pots that can truly be called cauldrons. These huge cast iron pots are prized by antique sellers because when it comes to vintage cast iron, the general rule is old is good, big is good, but old and big are better. Some of these big pots had a manufacturer's mark on them, which makes it easier to approximate their date of origin, but many of these are unmarked and much harder to identify. One general rule of thumb to follow would be to look at the ears on the side of the cauldron. This is not 100% accurate, but in general, pieces from the 20th century and maybe even the last part of the 19th century had rounded ears. This particular piece is likely from the early 20th century because it had a double gate mark, a size number, but no manufacturer, and smaller rounded ears. And what we are looking at is a vintage 19th century 15 gallon cast iron cauldron. Now, um, as you can see from the markings, this says number 12 and it says 15 gallons. This cauldron was made by the Savory Company of Philadelphia. And in fact, let's go on a uh, guided tour around to the other side where you can see the actual marking there. It says Savory and Company, Philadelphia. Uh, I did some research when I acquired this cauldron and I found that the Savory Company was in business from uh, the late 1700s up until uh, the late 
1800s. So based on an average, I think we can safely say this cauldron is most likely from the early to middle 1800s. It certainly has the um, trademark look of a uh, 19th century cauldron, among other things. As you can see, it has very, very thick legs on the bottom. Likewise, it has very thick ears, and most importantly, the ears are flat top and not rounded. It definitely has a gate mark on the bottom, but um, I certainly can't turn it over now to show you that. <laughs> Not when uh, we've got a, a nice propane fire going here. Um, I measured the uh, temperature. The outside is uh, reaching something like uh, 700 degrees, so I'm being careful about that. Whereas on the inside, it is uh, just over 500 degrees, which is good because that means we are seasoning a new layer here. Now the inside of this, I will admit, is uh, rather was rather pitted, which I think is one reason why I got this for what I consider to be a really affordable price at the Brimfield Antique Show. This was one of those um, once in a lifetime type of uh, deals that was offered to me, and I knew that I, if I said no to this, I would be kicking myself for the rest of my life. And that's why I took the uh, step and ended up with a genuine 15 gallon cast iron cauldron. So yes, I am uh, quite happy with this. <laughs> and what better potion can you conjure up in a huge cauldron than a big steaming pot of jambalaya? I hope you've enjoyed this look at different kinds of cast iron cauldrons, even though we've barely scratched the surface here. This could be a full-blown documentary on cauldrons if we're not careful, because there's so much to see and so much history to cover. But until we actually see a full history of cauldrons, I do hope this has inspired you to do some conjuring in a cauldron of your own, because it will certainly add a touch of magic to your Halloween celebration or indeed any time of the year at all. Thank you for watching. Oh, and I have to admit, I grimaced when Harry Potter read his shopping list and the list said he needed a pewter cauldron of number two size. Pewter? It's true that pewter is made of mostly tin, but you know what else is in pewter besides tin? Lead. <laughs> well, cheaper pewter is mixed with lead, and you can bet there are a lot of cheap pewter items out there, possibly including real pewter cauldrons. But while cauldrons have indeed been made of brass, bronze, silver, steel, and just about any metal you can think of, the traditional cauldron has always been made of cast iron.